This is the story of the one. As head of maintenance at a concert hall, he knows the show must always go on. That's why he works behind the scenes, ensuring every light is working, the HVAC is humming, and his facility shines. With Granger's supplies and solutions for every challenge he faces, plus 24-7 customer support, his venue never misses a beat. Call quickgranger.com or just stop by. Granger, for the ones who get it done. Your host, Andrew Donaldson. This is Heard Tell. Ah, welcome back to Heard Tell Show. It's Thursday, July the 14th, year of our Lord 2022. I'm Andrew Donaldson. Thank you so much for joining us with the most precious thing you have, your time. We've got some really loud stories. We want to try to turn down the noise of the news cycle on just a little bit. Ugly stories, tough stories. We need to get through them and touch on them. We've also got an uplifting story at the end of the program to get to a great guest on the show today. We're going to take a break from that real heavy stuff. Our historian friend, Sarah Stook is back. We're going to talk modern first ladies from Jackie Kennedy to Dr. Jill and all the ones in between good history, good perspective. As we talk about things like history and politics and culture, uh, the modern era, the TV era, since Jackie Kennedy, pretty much Sarah Stook on the program. They always enjoy her. That great story. We're going to end the program on a historic one. Statuary hall is getting an important and historic first, uh, in our nation's capital. We'll touch in on that from the state of Florida of all places. Uh, doing some good work. Uh, Two really tough stories we're going to open the program with. Our second segment, we're going to deal with this story about the 10-year-old girl that's been at the front and center of viral stories about abortion, uh, that there has been breaking news development. People debated that story. Even President Biden repeated it, whether it really happened because it was single source from one person. Turns out it did happen, and there's been charges filed. We'll touch in on that story in the second segment, but first, um, one of the worst stories we've had to cover since we started doing this program, and it's going to get even worse. Uh, down in Uvalde, Texas, folks, um, the Austin American Statesman and some other news outlets, they've gotten a hold of the security camera footage. Now, uh, warnings here, if this is sensitive to you, you might want to take a break from this particular segment. Uh, from the Austin American Statesman, a 77-minute video recording captured from a high vantage point uh, along with body camera footage from one of the responding officers obtained by the American Statements and KVUE shows the excruciating detail dozens of sworn officers, local, state, and federal, heavily armed, clad in body armor, helmets, some with protective ballistic shields, walking back and forth in the hallway, some leaving the camera frame and then reappearing. I'm going to repeat myself here for 77 minutes. Um, some leaving the camera frame and then reappearing, others training their weapons towards the classroom, talking, making cell phone calls, sending texts, and looking at the floor plans. One guy walks over and makes sure to use the hand sanitizer. Isn't that precious? Want to make sure he doesn't get any germs on him while the children are dying, um, but not entering or attempting to enter the classrooms. The statesman is publishing an edited version of the video to show how law enforcement F- response unfolded we are linking to this we have it up at ordinary-times.com both the edited short version and the longer version um it's already gone viral so i'll just mention this part they edited out the sound so they actually have a little placard up in the corner that says the children's screams have been edited out god help us that this is where we're at uh even austin american statesman again even after hearing at least four additional shouts shots from the classroom For 45 minutes after the police arrived on the scenes, the officers waited. They asked for keys to one classroom. It was unlocked, the investigators said later, even though they lied about that and said they were trying. We're looking at you, Pete Arredondo, liar. They brought tear gas and gas masks. They carried a sledgehammer, and yet still they waited. Officers finally rushed into the classroom and killed the gunman an hour and 14 minutes after police first arrived on the scene. 19 fourth graders and their two teachers died in the massacre. On May 24th, I'm going to go to a little bit earlier in the piece. I'm going to read it verbatim. This is well written, horrifically well written. The gunman enters the room. Children scream, describing the video. 
Gunfire continues, stops, then starts again, stops, then starts again, and again, and again. This is how this video goes. Um, down at the bottom of this piece, um, kind of the important part here, uh, further obscuring the truth of what happened May 24th, local, state, and federal officers have denied requests to release documents that could shed light on the police response, including 9-11 call transcripts, body camera footage, communication among law enforcement officials, and the arrest records from that day. They have appealed to uh, the Texas Attorney General to release this, which he has to make a decision on it. Meanwhile, anger boiled over Sunday night march and a rally in Uvalde. Folks, there has not been a single police resignation from this incident. Let me repeat myself. There has not been one single police officer involved in this that has not resigned yet. Now, I know Arredondo resigned from city council, gee, whoopee. But not one single person has stood up, taken accountability, and go, we screwed up, I'm resigning. They ought to all resign in shame. Go watch the video for yourself. Make your own determination. It's hard to watch but we must watch. We need to bear witness to what happened here and start holding some people accountable, especially our law enforcement. You want to say black, the blue, you want to support law enforcement. I support law enforcement. If you care about something, you hold it accountable. And there's something very wrong and rotten and terrible in the Uvalde police response to the Shrub elementary school. And we need to get to the bottom of it. And they need to quit hiding behind things and obscuring the information. Those dead children, whose screams were edited out of the video can't be edited out of history and out of the hearts and minds of the victim's families. And they deserve a hell of a lot better than they're getting from the police response, even now in trying to get to the truth. More her tell right after this. For the ones who know safety isn't a catchphrase, it's a culture. And the ones who help make sure everyone makes it home safe. For the safety-minded who watch everyone's backs, Granger offers supplies and solutions for every industry, as well as safety assessments and training to keep your facilities safe and your people safer. Call, click Granger.com, or just stop by. Granger, for the ones who get it done. Welcome back to Hurtel. Uh, it's been really loud out in social media realm and in the news media, of course, with all the news on abortion. There's been a particular story going around about a 10-year-old girl who had to leave Ohio to seek an abortion in a neighboring state. Even President Biden repeated it. A lot of people doubted whether it actually happened or not. It was loud. It was messy. It was very ugly, both in the news media and on social media. We've said before, when something's really loud and really viral, it never costs you points to just lay out of it and let it sort itself out, especially something like that, where the sourcing wasn't really good on the initial uh, look of it, and people weren't sure whether it was real or not, but it got loud. Well, now we know more about the story. Columbus Dispatch, a Columbus man, has been charged with impregnating a 10-year-old Ohio girl who traveled to Indiana to seek an abortion led to international attention following the Supreme Court's decision overturning Roe v. Wade and activation of Ohio's abortion law. Uh, Gerson Fuentes, 27, whose last known address was an apartment on Columbus's northwest side, was arrested Tuesday after police said he confessed to raping the child on at least two occasions. He's since been charged with rape, a felony of the first degree in the state of Ohio. Columbus police were made aware of the girl's pregnancy through a referral by Franklin County Children's Services that was made by her mother on June 22nd. Uh, Jeffrey Hahn testified Wednesday morning at Fuentes' arraignment on June 30th. The girl underwent a medical abortion in Indianapolis. Uh, Hune also testifies that DNA from the clinic in Indianapolis is being tested against samples from Fuentes as well as child's siblings to confirm contributions to the abortion. The 10-year-old girl, um, Ohio AG David Yost, had cast doubt on whether it happened or not, but now says he rejoices, that's in quotes, at the arrest. Franklin County Municipal Court Judge Cynthia Ebner said the case did not warrant Fuentes, who is believed to be undocumented, to be held without bond. Huh? 
Ebner said the high bond was necessary, however, due to Fuentes being a possible flight risk and for the safety of the child involved. Let's just stop here. You can read the rest of the piece. Uh, the bond is $2 million if you want to look into it. Uh, it. Turns out what happened here is this story came out because of the abortion doctor got it out there. Now, there's a lot of questions about this. For one thing is, uh, even with the new law in Ohio, this should have been able to be done in Ohio, but we can parse that out some other times. The fact that this individual is cl- apparently going to be an undocumented person and got bond anyway, even though they've apparently been credibly accused of raping a 10 year old at least twice. That's going to be messy for another day. Uh, this story isn't going to go away. Let's go back to where we started, though. When you have a complicated story and it goes viral, and you just ain't sure about it yet, and the reporting's a little spotty on it, we can't really verify it, like in this case where it was a single source. Now we know it was because there was a police investigation going on. Don't be afraid to just lay off a story. You don't lose social media points for waiting until we get the full details. Now we got the full details. This story went from horrific to even worse, believe it or not, because of the circumstances. I feel terrible for this young girl and her family. I hope justice is done if this man is proven to be guilty of these horrific crimes and they throw the book at him. But in the meantime, let's try to keep our bearing online a little better. These things get more and more complicated and they're going to get more and more loud. And we've got to keep our bearing as we try to discuss them, parse through them, and discern the times we live in on these very, very tough, touchy issues. More Hurt Tell right after this. Welcome back to her tell. Okay, she's one of our favorites. We talk history with her. We talk a little bit of political history, U.S. history, all kinds of fun stuff. She's also English, as you'll find out as soon as she starts talking. Sarah Stook, back on the program, talking first ladies today. How are you, ma'am? I'm good. Thank you for having me on again. Oh, we love having you. Welcome back. Okay, so you you did this whole series on first ladies that I absolutely love, elections-daily.com. We've linked to it. You need to read all the pieces of this multi-part series. But this is the modern age, kind of the last two pieces of this. Let, let's just go to the part that's really important here, because the modern age of the first lady changed when we got television. And it's a real clear defining line. And, and you mentioned it a little bit in your pieces. I don't think anybody in America knew what Mimi Eisenhower looked like. Everybody to this day knows what Jackie Kennedy looked like. That really is the dividing line between the modern first lady, isn't it? That's, I wouldn't say that's necessarily true. You know, Frances Cleveland in the late 19th century, her image was widely reproduced because she was young and pretty. Everybody knew what she looked like, but then you actually saw them properly through television. You saw them moving and talking, albeit in black and white, but, you know, still prominent to prominent and that yeah that's true that's when you started really seeing the first lady seeing the first family seeing the politicians and it wasn't accidental the kennedys were very savvy um the political machinations everybody knows the the background with joe we won't get into all that but we know how politically savvy and media savvy they were in a medium that was everybody was trying to figure it out at the same time we know about kennedy and the debates how they mastered that but the Jackie Kennedy stuff did not happen accidentally. That was part of the package deal, wasn't it? It was kind of like a, a politically arranged marriage in medieval Europe. You look for the perfect candidate, the perfect wife. And, you know, Kennedy was in his mid-30s. He wasn't married. There were rumours he was gay in the media, which would obviously put a massive kibosh on his campaign and even back then politicians they believed that you needed to be a family man you could cheat on your wife it was fine but you needed to be a family man and to Jackie who he knew she, he was, she was 12 years younger than him she was pretty she was young but most importantly Catholic from good family not political and would just be an asset to Jack Kennedy and it worked clearly because she's still revered today Anyone knows me knows of my love for Jackie. And of course, everybody knows the fashion stuff. They know the iconic status that she got. Of course, she was um, widowed. So the the outpouring of support and love the country gave her as the first modern era widow of a slain president. That that was a generational scar for a lot of people. And she was kind of the symbol of that. Um, 
behind that though, and one of the great things about your series is you actually talk about their relationships with the president. We know all the stories about JFK. Uh, he did a lot of things. He had a lot of sex. He even occasionally had sex with his wife. What was their actual relationship like though? Like you said, it was kind of an arranged marriage. They did have affection for each other. They'd known each other for a while. They ran in the same circles. What was their actual relationship beyond all the tabloid stuff? Kennedy always said he didn't like a woman with opinions, um, sort of a product of his father. The Kennedy boys w- went to play around. The Kennedy girls were straight laced, demure, married, no cheating. So he said he liked that. I mean, she wasn't unintelligent. She was uh, multilingual. She had a job before she met him. She went to top colleges. She was a very intelligent woman, but she wasn't political. They did have affection for one another, but and Jackie did. Th- no going in who she was marrying but her father was an adulterer and she said that's what men are like but she was not prepared for how bad he was he really was a love rat to the point where she nearly left him she had to be paid allegedly to stay because that would kill his political career it was only after the death of their son patrick that they really reconciled but obviously only a few months after that kennedy died How much of the Jackie Kennedy mythology and JFK, by extension, kind of lingers over any time you start talking about the first ladies? Like we said, she's the first TV one, so she's the first mass media one. She's kind of the, when you talk about, you know, fashion and the the photogenic part of it, that's kind of the standard. Talk about how that's kind of been the the building of the mythology of the modern first lady. That's kind of who people start comparing them to, isn't it? Well, yeah, because she was so popular, they were always going to compare it to the most popular person, as every president would be compared to Lincoln or Washington, perhaps. So she's sort of the standard bearer. She had no major scandals in office. She was intelligent without being, you know, maybe too threatening, which I think a lot of people don't like, especially in women. She was the standard bearer to which all first ladies are compared. Melania Trump's compared to her for a fashion, Michelle Obama, Hillary Clinton was compared to her. Everybody is compared to her. She is sort of the model. You want to be compared to Jackie Kennedy. Another woman who put up with a lot from a very highly suspect personal character man was her, um, I guess, successor as first lady, uh, Lady Bird Johnson, LBJ. I All through the Trump years, I've kind of chuckled a little bit because people talk about how uncouth uh, Trump is. I was like, you ought to read up on LBJ. Trump's a piker compared to this guy. <laughs> um LBJ was a very vulgar man, a very loud man, a very brash man. He welded power and he didn't hide it. He was just, you know, bigger than life in a lot of ways. Lady Bird Johnson managed to really carve herself out a little niche as first lady and as her own personality. And you want to talk about contentious relationships, though, I I would love to have been a fly on the wall on some of their conversations over the year. But tell folks, maybe generationally removed, she doesn't get talked about. You know, again, Jackie Kennedy probably overshadows her a little bit. Talk about her, because she's really a fascinating character in American history, not just as a first lady, just as a woman. A a Southern Belle who had to work um, to help her family. She was very intelligent. She got a good inheritance, which she used very wisely to create her own radio stations to fund her husband's campaign. She was very much the demure Southern Belle, quiet, genteel. She said her husband came before anybody else, even her daughters. And she was a moderating force to her husband. I mean, don't get me wrong, he treated her absolutely terribly. But he did love her. I guess in some kind of way he loved her and she was the one who could calm him down. If you wanted to go to get something into him, you went to her first. She apologised to Secret Service when he was rude to them. She apologised to everyone when he was rude to them because that was pretty much guaranteed LBJ being rude to somebody. I, I find it amazing. People like JFK, people like LBJ, they didn't have to deal with the internet, how much different their presidencies and their <laughs> legacies would be if they had the internet. Because I mean, this stuff's all out there now. A lot of people don't read it because they're not history nerds like you and me. Um, I had an uncle that actually worked in the LBJ White House. The stories of that guy and the stuff he got away, he, he literally exposed himself to the press on multiple occasions. Like the stuff that happened back then, we think the press... <laughs> And the media is bad now. Can you imagine if there was an internet when these get when the Kennedy brothers were doing what they were doing? It, it's mind boggling, isn't it? It's mad. It's like if Joe Biden started, you know, sleeping with Angelina Jolie, the big beautiful movie star, 
like kind of did it with mom Rao. Oh, that would break the internet and not a few people's eyeballs. Uh, moving on to other matters. Let's talk about a first lady who's probably in the rare category. She's probably more famous for what she did after the white house than being in the white house, Betty Ford. Um, of course, Gerald Ford has a very unique presidency because he kind of took the bullet to heal the nation after Nixon. We all know that he was, a you know, an honorable man. But Betty Ford, with her addiction stuff, this is long before people, you know, mental health and addiction really came to the forefront. She's really known the Betty Ford Center and that stuff. It's pretty rare for a first lady to get that kind of publicity after the White House, but she managed it. She's a very remarkable lady who said she would give her life for her husband to have her polling numbers. Conservative Republicans, especially within his administration, you know, like Dick Cheney is one example, didn't particularly like her because she was so outspoken on everything from abortion to adultery, gay rights, part everything. And But she was popular. People liked her because she was candid. She was honest. I think they wanted more of a Pat Nixon, someone who would just sort of blend into the background, not rock the vote a bit. But she revolutionised the office of first lady. When she talks about her breast cancer, millions of women got checked because you didn't talk about that then, especially when it was a women's health in such a sensitive area. And she encouraged women to get help for alcoholism and addiction because, you know, up until that point in history women didn't really work so many housewives turned to drink and drugs because they had no outlet for other things because they had no choice in what they did and it was seen as okay you know you could have a social drink and you could have your painkillers but then Betty made sure it was okay to say look how it affects your family and things like that and the thing about her is and this is one of those things again the internet nowadays we would have known it most people probably didn't realize that that came from a very personal place with her because like a lot of people that take up uh, advocacy over addiction issues and domestic issues, her father who lost her, I think she was 16 when he died, something very young, drank himself into an early grave. People didn't probably know that piece of the story, but that's really what drove her pretty much the rest of her life. It drove her in her marriage and her devotion to her husband. And it drove her when she went to go about her advocacy too, didn't it? Well, it's believed he killed himself. Obviously, back then it was fussed up because suicide was such a big taboo. But she was terrified of people finding out. It's the same with Eleanor Roosevelt, whose father, he didn't really technically kill himself. I don't think he meant to, but he was in like a drunk maniac thing when he fell out of a window. But she didn't want people to find out. She was kind of about everything, but that was, you know, off limits. Because it, people was question her husband's presidency. It's crazy. But even... You know, the idea of somebody being a bit mentally unstable or unfortunately hurting themselves, you didn't talk about it. Yeah. And so much of what we now understand as mental health back in the older days, people just self-medicated because they didn't they maybe didn't know what it was or how to handle it. And alcohol was the thing there. One more from that generation, though. And this, the amazing thing is they just celebrated their anniversary. We still have both of them. Uh, Jimmy Carter's presidency is not at the top of the list. But if you're going to have presidential marriages, he he might be one, two, three, somewhere real, real high on that list with Rosalind Carter. Mighty. Some six years just gone the other day. I can't imagine being married amazing. to somebody for that long. That's longer than the normal lifespan. They've been married. That's exactly. Amazing. God bless them. But anyway, tell us about Rosalind Carter. Um, she and Jimmy got married when they were very young, but they also had the benefit of they're both very long lived. They're both in the late nineties. So I think, mean, you know, the youth and long lived, it sort of helps to create a long marriage, but probably one of the most stable and loving marriages. She sat in on cabinet meetings, which I don't think is particularly appropriate for a uh, non-official, but she only wrote notes she didn't really sort of interject she was her husband's counsel they had four children no hints of scandal apart from Jimmy's lust in his heart for other women comments which obviously will probably haunt him forever and I'm sure that Rosalind never let that one go but she was an advocate for mental health which I think is really great because again 70s 80s very taboo era known for just being a nice a young a nice woman in a loving marriage and sort of what i think everyone would aspire to in such in their future marriage 
that was a Playboy interview where Jimmy Carter had a moment of being too honest and saying the quiet part out loud that everybody's had the same issue with. But how quaint does that feel after the last couple of years of scandal and everything <laughs> we're doing? How quaint is that that the guy's like, yeah, I might have thought about another woman like three times in my whole life to the woman I've been married to for 76 years. I think we'd take that scandal nowadays, wouldn't we? Yeah. Yeah, bless their hearts. They're still alive and kicking down in Georgia. Um, we're going to get into the modern era. Sarah Stoke joining us. I love talking about this stuff because it, it gives us perspective on history and politics. We come back. Uh, we got some heavy hitters coming up on the first lady list. Nancy Reagan, Michelle Obama, Melania, Melania Trump that we just had. Of course, Jill Biden also. The both Bushes. A lot to cover still. Sarah Stoke on her tell right after this. to her tell uh sarah stook she's been learning about first lady she's our historian friend we love having her on the program getting ready to do vice president she said can't wait to dig into that one uh let's go to the superstar couple uh and quite literally really when you think you know ronald reagan and nancy reagan long marriage it was actually his second marriage believe it or not that was a little bit of a controversy at the time it's another one of those things that seems quaint nowadays after we just had a president that had only his third wife um Nancy Reagan, total advocate for her husband. They were just mad for each other. You always think of them as a couple. She did have some controversies, especially in the 80s with some of the social stuff that was going on. But talk about Nancy Reagan beyond the just being Ronnie's. She always called him Ronnie no matter what. Who was the actual lady, the actual person underneath all that? Well, she came from a very established uh, background. She was born Anne Frances um, Robbins, but took the name Nancy Davis in honour of her stepfather, who was actually a friend of Reagan's. He was a um, celebrated um, neurosurgeon. Uh, surgeon. He was, she was an actress who also met Reagan, fell in love, got married. He was initially a bit hesitant to get married after his first marriage ended in failure, but obviously... It worked out pretty well for them. Actor William Holden was their best man. Obviously, um, she helped raise his children for his first marriage and children of their own. Um, she's very controversial in that she could be a bit prickly. People said Reagan was lovely. She was a bit mean sometimes. But as you said, she is mainly n- devoted to Reagan. That is that is her because she said everything revolves around him. She didn't have any ambitions beyond him, including their children, which was meant that she had a pretty poor relationship with them, actually. Yeah, the stepchildren and the stepmother did not get along well. One of the colorful little bits about Nancy, um, which I guess is a little understandable under the circumstances, but you touched on it in your piece in elections-daily.com, though, was when Reagan got shot, she got a little bit superstitious and a little bit, she went from protective to overprotective, but tell that story just a little bit, because it's kind of funny now in hindsight, I kind of get it. You know, you're trying to reach for something because he did, we did find out years later, he was about a quarter of an inch from dying. If that bullet had been just a little bit over, but Nancy did not react to that particularly well, did she? Yeah. Well, she started consulting an astrologer to map when was best for Reagan to go out and do events. And she basically booked his schedule so she had control of it and she was mocked relentlessly um you know some say is it comparable to religion or is it just you know superstition you know people have various views and I think even people who believe in astrology I'm not one of them probably think it was a bit much but yeah your husband nearly died in office that's pretty horrific I mean she would have seen what it would have done to you know poor Jackie Kennedy so I think you can kind of understand being a bit nervous and the only reason why he survived was because he was in such good health if he'd been any and he was pretty old as well so fair placement but if he had been in any worse condition he would have probably died all right one of the real unique women in history because she's one of only two women to be both first lady and the mother of a president that's a pretty exclusive club 
uh, Barbara Bush. She's actually a descendant of Franklin Pierce, who was one of our worst presidents ever, even though he was most think the most handsome president. You can take that for what you will. Um, very interesting story. Um, they met. Uh, he went off to World War II. He came back from World War II. They got married. Uh, long marriage, of course, the political dynasty. Um, Bush Sr. did have his affairs. He had a long-running affair where his uh, secretary actually traveled with him, was kind of well-known. But by all measures, especially in political terms, a very successful and happy marriage, all told, yeah? Oh, completely. Obviously, they had um, the ups and downs. Their daughter, Robin, tragically dying of leukemia in the 50s, which is a bad enough disease now. But obviously, back then... You were very, you know, it, it wasn't really a positive, it wasn't, you weren't going to have a positive outcome by any means. But she was a very strong world, an intelligent woman. You know, she sort of, she never really worked beyond marriage as was sort of the tradition of the time, but that doesn't make her by any means a lesser first lady. She could be very opinionated. And she got in trouble when she implied that um, Geraldine Ferrero was a word that rhymed with rich in her words so yeah she was um she said very powerful very intelligent woman who oversaw her children's lives and education helped her somewhat with dyslexia which um made her interested in literacy and uh, learning dis- um difficulties so pretty remarkable woman who everyone just thinks of that nice white-haired old lady Oh, no, she was fierce. And one of my favorite Barbara Bush stories, um, W told it when they did the funeral for his father. Um, she was absolutely fierce. There's this legendary story where they're at the compound in Kenny Bunkport, Maine, which was their summer house, the, the Bush compound there. And she did not want the Secret Service following her around anymore because she's no longer a public official. And I don't care who's trying to kill me. You're not going to follow me around. I'm going to live my life. And somebody and they George said it was WW said it was George. Somebody told a Secret Service agents to tailor anyway. And she went to the store or whatever and caught him tailing her. She made him take him take her back to the compound. And they had a meeting in a room with the former president, the other former president, the head of the Secret Service detail and Barbara Bush just dressing them all down, telling them and, and using pretty colorful language, depending on which version of the story you believe. This was a fierce woman. When you have a husband that's a president, a son that's a president, I guess you kind of have to be. But she was very, very, very strong, wasn't she? Yeah, she was very, very, well, yeah, because think about it. If Reagan had died, she would have been first lady quite a few years earlier, eight years earlier. And, you know, raising children, I mean, all her children, apart from uh, the dearly departed Robin, were involved in politics in public life in some um, respect. I mean, Jeb could have been president in a crazy, what if, please clap world. Please clap. Uh, since we're pairing them anyway, let's just go ahead and talk about Laura Bush. Kind of the opposite of Barbara in a lot of ways, although they had some similarities. They were both, you know, very, very well um, apportioned women, very proper. They, they knew how to play the role. She was a librarian of all things. Um, and then, of course, W's been very open. You know, he was basically a fall down drunk for about a decade. She kind of helped him through that. He found religion. He stopped drinking. He was a dedicated family man with her by all accounts. Talk about Laura Bush, because she's another one of those. She she mostly stayed out of the spotlight, pretty much avoided controversy of any kind. Um, and yet she was just kind of always there, kind of, you know, textbook first lady stuff. Yeah. I think she gets forgotten because she's between Hillary and Clinton and Michelle Obama, two, you know, Ivy League educated women with full career. Well, I'm not saying that her career wasn't full, but, you know, they were lawyers, so extra education, et cetera. But she was very popular because she wasn't at all controversial. Her issues included reading, um, heart failure, breast cancer and women in Afghanistan, which is probably like the the safest issues any first lady could go for. And, you know, up until that point, I think probably the Bush presidency was a time where it was more likely a woman could become president. But she was still, you know, a bit of the old school generation. She was born in the 40s, married in the 70s. So while, you know, the sexual revolution had happened, there was that more tradition of, you know, being a bit more demure. But she wasn't political either. She said, look, I'm not interested. She voted, but she wasn't, you know, she was a bit of a Jackie. She didn't really care that much 
which I think helps a lot because if she'd been tarnished with her husband's brush, then she'd be very unpopular because obviously we know how his presidency ended. Joining us. Okay, her predecessor, of course, you just mentioned her, the opposite of that, the uber ambitious, uber political Hillary Clinton. Where do we start with her? Because we know a lot more about the Clinton presidency now than we did then. Again, another one of these, we we first got the internet with the scandals. You know, that was kind of the, the Drudge Report and all that that got the Lewinsky story out there. But it wasn't like it was now. Um, the stuff he got away with in Arkansas, we know the allegations and all that long before that. Where do we start parsing out Hillary Clinton? Because she was a senator in her own right later. She ran for president a couple of times. There's just a lot of stuff there. But as far as her being a first lady, how do you kind of view her and package her up when it comes to to the historical nature of being a first lady and then becoming a political figure in her own right afterwards? Well, obviously, I try to be as nice as possible when it comes to the first ladies, though I was honest if they had their, their shortfalls. Um, not a huge fan of Hillary. I respect her in some right. I mean, she went to Yale Law when probably not many women did. She was, she was very intelligent. I'm not going to dispute any of that about her, and I respect her. But I think a first lady should be allowed to have opinions. You know, I mean, if I was first lady, I certainly would. And I think it's great when they have their views on politics if you look at you know Eleanor Roosevelt for example my favorite first lady but she made the mistake of trying to basically be an official when she wasn't elected and it'd be the same for any man woman related to the president you know when she was put on them um, leading um the commission on health care and trying to do legislation fair enough she had some experience but people questioned it why is this unelected person leading the charge and and she wasn't popular she made comments about stay-at-home mothers which I know obviously they are rarer now but they are just as equal and deserving as respects as career women and I think that was a very very bad idea I always wondered with Hillary you know I think what you just said about her being an official when she wasn't then there was the stand by your man stuff um there was the uh victim shaming that she engaged in as part of protecting the Clinton brand, which was self-protection for her. You just can't talk about the Hillary stuff without the hypocrisy stuff, because that's what really sunk her on a lot of this. And some of it's probably a little unfair, but some of it she brought on herself. But when she was actually first lady, um, the healthcare thing, I think, just kind of dented her, where they put her in charge of healthcare and that failed. I don't know that she ever really recovered because from that point on, she no longer got to be seen as a first lady. From then on, it was always, oh, she's political. And I yeah. think that I think that's the big difference when it comes to Hillary is I don't think she ever really had a period in the White House where she was just the first lady and nothing else. She tried. She did a few sort of, you know, events like the Easter egg roll and Christmas. But, you know, like I said, she was never people said she should have been president instead kind of that kind of you know I think there's been a few first ladies where they would have sort of been candidates for president and that they were very political ambitious women yeah and then we had Edith Wilson who actually did it but that's another topic for another day uh Michelle Obama uh fascinating thing she actually I didn't you mentioned in your piece I didn't know this she actually met uh Barack or Barry then uh, because she was his mentor when he was an intern. <laughs> so that's kind of an interesting story. But uh, you're talking about ambitious. She's the opposite. She tells everybody that will listen that she has no ambition for politics. She didn't like being in the White House, particularly because of the political stuff and the things that went on. But a very smart, astute woman. Um, not a whole lot of major controversy, although she is outspoken and opinionated on certain things. But talk about Michelle Obama, kind of one of our more contemporary first ladies. I mean, you know, she went to Princeton, Harvard. She's only first lady with two Ivy League degrees. So, you know, you've got to say that's pretty darn impressive. And I think, yeah, like you said, she is political in somewhat of it. You know, she has her views. But I think unlike Hillary, 
she has the benefit of that she's not politically ambitious for her own sake. She doesn't want to be involved in politics as a politician. And I think people like her more than like Hillary for that because she's still an intelligent woman and a good role model. But then she has had her critics when she said she's never really been proud of America and things like that. I kind of understand what she was trying to say, but the way she said it isn't the greatest way of conveying your views. So, but I don't think people would remember that as much as Hillary's mistakes. Maybe people have a short memory when it comes to Michelle as opposed to Hillary. Yeah, I think Hillary shades Michelle a little bit because Hillary is so ambitious. I think a lot of people just assumed that Michelle was going to be ambitious like that, and she's not, which I think is a little, I have my criticisms of the Obamas, but I think that's a little unfair. I think she got tagged, especially since Hillary ran against her husband. They're like, oh, well, she'll run too like Hillary. And it's like, no, they're different people, very different people. So I think that was a little unfair. All right, Melania Trump. Um, we've got a little distance from the Trump administration. I think history will be decently kind to her, even though her husband continues to do things that will probably cause history to not be kind to him. I, I think she bore it about as well as somebody in that circumstances could bear it and handle it. Uh, what's your take on uh, our last uh, former first lady that we had, Melania Trump? I don't know if history will be particularly kind because I think there's very much an anti-feminist slant the treatment of Melania Trump. Now, she posed nude as a model, which is something I would never do, but that is her prerogative. And people criticised her for it, but she's never been hypocritical about it. She's never been like an open prude or say, no, women shouldn't do this, women shouldn't wear that. And the people who say celebrate body positivity and celebrate other women are extremely critical of her. And I believe if she'd been a Democrat or not married to Donald Trump, she probably would have been on the cover of a lot of fashion magazines because she's an elegant person. I wouldn't say she was an outstanding first lady, but she didn't want the job. And you've got to sort of understand that. I don't know. I don't know what their relationship is because obviously there's an arrangement there. People like that do not have normal marriages. They they just don't. They're not like people that are working nine to five jobs. I don't think she wanted to be there. And I I I give her slack for the fact that she didn't want to be there, but she's she she went on with it anyway. So and and I'm no fan of her husband's, but I don't think she did any great disgrace to the country. I know political opponents will smear her for this, that, and the other, but it could have been a lot worse. Can you imagine if she was uber politically political like her husband was i think it was about as good as it could have possibly been is that a fair way to put it yeah i mean i, w- I wouldn't say she's ever going to be ranked as a highly you know highly placed first lady you know, her campaign against bullying is a little strange considering what her husband can be like on twitter or was before he was unceremoniously banned um or she, she had that i don't care jacket so i make birth the comments which sound bad, but then you remember she didn't really do much else in terms of scandal or being a first lady generally. Yeah. All right, real quick before we got to let you go, though, our current first lady, uh, Jill Biden, not her given name, I'll let you get into that in a second, but uh, she has her doctorate in education, first first lady to have an official job outside of the White House. I think that's actually something we'll probably see more of as we have, you know, we've already had a couple of lawyers, I think, I think nowadays, if you had a Hillary Clinton or even Michelle Obama, I, I think if they wanted to work, it would be accepted now. I think we'll see that in the future. But we, we don't want to do a legacy thing because she's still doing it. But Jill Biden as our current first lady. She's not really had the opportunities to do as much, maybe because of COVID's put a damper on a lot of events. You know, Easter egg roll and everything like that is associated with the first lady, which maybe gives her more time to go and do other things. But I think she has options if she wants somebody to step in. Like Kamala Harris can do some of it. Kamala Harris's husband, their daughter, any they she stop has the opportunity, you know, all the like all, all the first ladies who were maybe poorly would have their daughters or daughter in laws do it. I don't think she's sort of a traditional first lady in that, you know, she's not gonna do the responsibilities as much as we'd expect. Even like Mich- Michelle Obama did that, and she was a very intelligent, educated woman. Um, as for if they'll work, I think that will depend on who the president is. I think Republicans might be a bit more wary. I'm not saying they oppose women working, but they might be a bit more thinking how a 
a first lady would act. So if Ron DeSantis became president, how would his wife be versus you know, any Democrat? Yeah, she's pretty traditional, but we'll have to wait and see. Uh, one last thing on Jill Biden, though. She, she's had some missteps uh, vocally. I think I, her current controversy down in San Antonio, San Antonio is a city I've spent a lot of time in over the years. Um, the taco thing, she said. Breakfast tacos, breakfast burritos. Is it, Let's not even get into that portion. I, I think <laughs> I blame the speechwriter because she's just reading the copy they gave her. But still, like you got to have a little bit of bearing. But she can't be doing stuff like that. She is going to start getting the flag. But that's part and parcel of the comm shop of this entire White House. They're not real good at stuff like that. They do a lot of cell phones like that. Anyway, Sarah Stuck, we love having you. We love talking about this stuff. Gives us some historical perspective on current events. Uh, you I already told us you're going to do vice presidents next. I can't wait for that series. Let folks know where you're writing, what you're writing on, and your social media so they can follow you until we get you back on her tell again. Um, Elections Daily, um, The Malad, which is a, a British publication. My um, Twitter is at Sarah underscore Stook, which is S T W O K. I forgive you if you I only mispronounces it because everybody does apparently or can't spell it. So you'll be easy to find me because there's not many other Stooks or Sarah Stooks on Twitter. Uh, either which way, however you say it, you do fantastic work. We love having you on. We'll do it again real, real soon, my friend. Thank you so much for the time. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. For the ones who know safety isn't a catchphrase, it's a culture. And the ones who help make sure everyone makes it home safe. For the safety-minded who watch everyone's backs, Granger offers supplies and solutions for every industry, as well as safety assessments and training to keep your facilities safe and your people safer. Call, click Granger.com or just stop by. Granger, for the ones who get it done. Welcome back to Hurt Tell. We always end on a good note. This is a historically good note. Statuary Horror, if you've never been to the U.S. Capitol, amazing place. All the important folks in history, the states get to put somebody that represents them up. It's an amazing place. Uh, we have a historic edition. Educator and civil rights activist Mary McLeod Bethune, we're going to read from NPR here, made history on Wednesday as the first black person to have a state commission statue in the U.S. Capitol Statuary Hall where her statue replaced that of a Confederate general. Beth Hune, the daughter of formerly enslaved peoples, was the influential educator and activist who, among her many other accomplishments, founded the National Council for Negro Women, advised multiple U.S. presidents, and created a boarding school for black children that would later become Beth Hune Cookman University in Daytona Beach, Florida. The larger-than-life statue has been on display in the home state of Florida since 2021. Before making the journey to Washington, D.C., it was formally unveiled in a ceremony led by House Speaker Nancy Pelosi and featured many of the lawmakers and activists who fought and fundraised for years to make the moment possible. Florida Democrat U.S. Rep. Kathy Castor said the ceremony that Bethune epitomized all the values of the state. The first to be represented by a black American in the National Statuary Hall holds dear from industriousness to thirst for education due to the desire for peace. Uh, we, this is a quote, we lift her up today at a time of competing ideologies to help heal and unify through her example, because she also lived in a time of division, but was determined to stand up to dissenting voices, including those of the KKK to do what so many said could not be done. Castor added that she hopes Bethune's statue will serve as a symbol of hope, justice, love for America and all of mankind. The 11 foot statue, which weighs more than 6,000 pounds was sculpted out of the largest and last piece of statuary marble from Michelangelo's quarry in Italy. It was created by artist Nalda Comas, who was chosen from a field of 1,600 applicants and is the first Hispanic master sculptor to create a statue for the National Statuary Hall State Collection. It's a historic addition to the famous collection, one that followed a lengthy process and will likely not be the last such swap. Important piece of history. Neat thing to visit next time you're in the Capitol a worthy honor from our country to a remarkable woman that'll do it for her to tell make sure you're following us 
on wherever you're listening or watching this program, YouTube, iTunes, Spotify. doesn't cost you anything to subscribe. It never will, but do subscribe. Make sure you share us too. We don't advertise other than word of mouth and what we do on our social media, so we sure appreciate you letting folks know about our program. Love to hear from you at Show on gmail.com, Show at the Twitter. Reach out to us, questions, comments, epistles, even criticisms. Love to hear it. Keep your bearing. Be nice, but we'd love to hear from you. We've even done whole segments just off feedback so don't hold back let us hear from you that'll do it for her tell today uh until we do it again we hope wherever you are across the street or around the world you and yours are well we hope you're well fed and we'll talk to you again real soon for more her tell all the music on her tell is provided under a creative content license from monstercat.com so,